This is Orson Welles, speaking from London. The Black Museum. Here in the grim stone structure on the Thames which houses Scotland Yard is a warehouse of homicide. A warehouse where a parchment lampshade, an automobile tire, a canvas tarpaulin, an umbrella, all are touched by murder. And here's a dictionary. It's a familiar object. French into English, English into French. Every high school student knows what these books are like. Word here, phrase there. Merci, thank you, thank you, merci. And of course, a use common to most young men in countries not their own. Je t'aime. Je t'aime. <laughs> oh, you sound so, uh, so passionate, Jules. What does that mean? Uh, in the little book, uh, one moment, uh, je t'aime and I love you. Well, today the dictionary can be seen in the Black Museum. From the annals of the Criminal Investigation Department of the London Police, we bring you the dramatic stories of the crimes recorded by the objects in Scotland Yard's Gallery of Death, the Black Museum. <laughs> I have to go home. Oui. Mais je viens. I come also. Oh, 
Jew. That's impossible. However, the usual sighs and protestations, of course, it was just a brief interlude that it was a trifle saddened to let it go. After all, when a woman is crowding for it, is it? She went home anyway to Sussex, to the Binnacle Inn, to security of sorts, and to her husband, Al. Business hasn't been too bad while you were away, Bessie. All the rooms were let this week, and the bar trade was fine. I dare say you did all right by the bar. The landlord's got to be social girl. Otherwise, his customers go somewhere else. There's a difference, Alf, between social and drunk. Yeah, no, none of that. I take a drop now and then, but I don't get drunk. Yeah. Well, another customer. Hmm. Business is picking up, and on the hotel side at that. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. How can I help you, sir? Uh, I have, uh, how do you say, uh, one moment, please. Uh, uh, I will find the word. Ah, oui, I have come to stay. What do you know? A, a froggy. Uh, please to have you, Monsieur. And uh, may I ask how you found us? Uh, so I, uh, uh, well, that is, uh, uh, Monsieur Brown, I, the marvelous Madame Brown, is the recommendation for your so select hotel. Is it not so that we have met in Provence, madame? The little Frenchman must have been mad. Mad with love. With just a little touch in the head. In any case, he'd come just as he said, to stay. As he explained it to Al Brown. I am, how you say, an inventor. I have... Much great ideas. Yes, yes, sure, Gamma, sure. But uh, do you make any money? To make money? Uh, je ne comprends pas. Money, uh, shillings, uh, francs. Uh... Ah, oui, beaucoup d'argent. Oh, right now I wake from Canada. Much money. And uh, what do you invent to get all this beaucoup money? The wireless. I am in the wireless. Very much interest. Well, Monsieur... If you can get music out of the air, maybe you can get some money out of the same place to pay what you owe us. Huh? You've been here a month now, and we haven't seen a shilling on your board bill. Board bill? Come on. Uh, I... There was another conversation shortly thereafter on the same subject, if not exactly on the same polite level. Look, Bessie, he's your friend. We've got to have some money. How can I ask him for money, even if he is our friend? Yours. Not mine. He doesn't take walks with me every afternoon. Alf Brown, are you suggesting? I'm not suggesting, dearie. I'm telling you. Get some money out of him or out he goes. You're supposed to be the business head in this family. All right. Tend to business here. Well, you never talked to me like this before. It was the first time for everything, they say. For the first time, Al was in the driver's seat and he knew it. So did Betty know it. On one of their afternoon walks. She said as much to you. You? We must have you. I suspect. <laughs> he will do nothing, jamais. He's after me. Huh? To get money from you. <laughs> What's he laughing at? I'm telling you, his house will be real nasty. <laughs> me throw us both out. And you without a pen. <laughs> well, it's not funny. He holds the whip hand. Don't you understand? Uh, we, uh, one moment. Oh, oh, Jew. Not that little book again. Yes, a more on the petit livre. Uh, ah, you see, I have it. Like an Englishman, so... Ah, one may steal his wife, but not owe to him money. Never fear, mon ami. In a few days, beaucoup d'argent. You like? Oui? To Betty, he said. Je t'aime, ma chérie. Do not fear. All will be well. A quiet, dull New Year's morning. The routine of the inn continued, minus the overtired, oversleeping maid. After a while, the master came grumbling down the stairs. 
Bessie! Bessie, where are you? Oh, please. I think Mr. Damash is going. Well, let him go to this room, then. Uh, pardon, monsieur? Into my chambre, you wish for me to go? Oui? Oh, no, no, no need for that. Is there out? Oh, so long as he's awake, I don't care, one way or another. Where's my salt? You, you know I can't start a day without Miss Salt. <laughs> uh, I know, dear. Uh, they're where you'd expect them to be, on the mantel shelf, in their regular place. Oh, yes, I forgot. If I may disturb you, Monsieur. Oh, but of course. The chair before the fire. Very nice, oui? <laughs> Très charmant. When it is uh, so very cold outside. Oh, thanks. Bessie, Bessie, that glass is here. Where's that tablespoon and some water? Oh, I'll get them for you. Just a moment, dear. Jules Gamache stood in the bay window and watched the little domestic scene. Occasionally, he riffled through his ever-present dictionary as if for a word to describe the events he was watching. Such inconsequential little events. Betty came trotting back from the kitchen with a tablespoon and a pitcher of water. She put them on the table alongside the salt and glass. Hal measured his own dosage, poured it into the glass. Then he poured in the water. Almost mockingly, he raised his glass as if in a toast to the Frenchman standing nearby. Then down the contest, the glass. Oh, oh, those salts taste bitter this morning. Yeah, they are never sweet, no? There's nothing sweet about them. Then why complain, dear? You had more to drink than usual last night, so the salts taste more bitter than usual. <laughs> Betty, 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 get, get some help. Oh, it's the cramps. Oh, oh, oh I can't stand it. I can't stand it. It's awful. Oh, Joe, get a doctor. Call the cook. Do something. I, I will try. My English, it is not good. No, no but oh, I will try. Oh, my, my feet. My feet, they itch. Oh, they're driving me crazy. The pain, the pain, and the itching. Oh. Shortly thereafter, Alfie Brown was quite dead. And so the tragedy reached its climax. And playing its little part in that tragedy was a certain dictionary which, as I told you, can be seen today in the Black Museum. Dr. Westcott, the local physician, was called at once, but far too late. Alf Brown was past help. The doctor listened gravely to the story as Betty told it to him. While Jules stood by, the very picture of solicitude. <laughs> oh, he went so quick, doctor. And it's such agony. Cramps and groans. And he said the strangest thing. What was that, Mrs. Brown? <laughs> well, he cried out that his feet were itching. It was almost the last thing he said. Is that right, Mr. Merton? Oui, Monsieur le Docteur, ça avait raison. Well, if you say so, it's, it's an interesting symptom. A peculiar one, particular poison. Though how this household will come by, I haven't the slightest idea. Poison? But, Doctor, it was his sauce. Although he did complain that they tasted more bitter than usual. Anything else, Mrs. Brown? I, I, no, no, nothing else. Oh, I'm so upset. Confused. But what poison? How? Itching feet, bitter taste, great pain, or oh, they all point to strychnine. Uh, but of course, we won't be able to know for certain until there's been a post-mortem. Oh, doctor, 
Squire. Well, I, I can't sign a certificate under these circumstances. I have to notify the coroner and the police. Oh. Now, uh, I, I think our next precaution is for you to give me the bottle, the spoon, and the glass into my charge. Uh, uh, where are they? Oh, well, I, I don't quite... Do you, uh, I mean, Mr. Gamache, do you remember? Uh, je ne sais pas, madame. Je ne comprends pas. Oh, come, Mrs. Brown. Now, now pull yourself together. Uh, you want to catch the party who poisoned your husband, don't you? Perhaps there was a better question than Dr. West could realize. It was pure rhetoric at that moment, as far as he was concerned. Of course, the widow wanted to catch the murderer. Still took a bit of concentrated prodding of Betty's memory until she said... I know now, Doctor. I put them in the drawer of the kitchen table when I left Port Arthur for a moment to fetch some tea and soda. I thought it might help. They found the bottle and the glass and the spoon in the kitchen table drawer. The doctor looked at them closely. Someone has washed these thoroughly. There, there are still traces of water in the bottle and the glass. Mrs. Brown, I, I'm going to the police at once. And Dr. Westcott went to the local police. The local police went to Scotland Yard. Betty Brown went to Jules Gamache. You did it, Jules. I don't know how, but you did it. Uh, ma? Ma chérie, ma foi, impossible. You did you killed Alfred, and you stayed right there and watched him die. But Betty, you are most... Uh, how is it? Uh, ah, oui. You are most hysterical. You know I do not kill your Alfie. You must know this. I know. I feel it in my bones. You killed him. Go away, Joe. Go away. I never want to see you again as long as I live. <laughs> Sadly, as if overwhelmed by the unpredictability of women, Jules Gamache packed his things and left the binnacle inn. But he didn't go far. Just to the next village and the next inn, there he waited and watched. Waited to hear from his beloved, now widowed, his Betty. Waited for developments in the case which the coroner's jury had labeled death at the hands of person or persons unknown. The developments were not long in coming. My name is West, Mrs. Brown, Inspector West, Scotland Yard. My credentials. Uh, y yes, sir. I have a few questions, particularly concerning the disposal of the poison. I'll, uh, I'll try to answer them, Inspector. Do you know who washed out the bottle and glass? No, I'm afraid I don't. I left them in the kitchen. We were all so upset by poor Alfred's suffering. We were rather hysterical, I'm afraid. I understand. No idea on that. I see. Uh, tell me, Mrs. Brown, have you ever used any kind of weed killer in the garden of this inn? Uh, no, sir. Not that I know of. Poison for rodents, rats, mice, and so on? N no, sir. We've never been troubled by such. Have you any idea who might have wanted to kill your husband, Mrs. Brown? No, I haven't. Thank you very much, Mrs. Brown. If I could... The inspector left the front of the house, so to speak, and visited below stairs. He had a nice talk with the cook over a cup of tea. Mrs. Davis, did you wash out the salts bottle? No, why should I? I've got enough work. And that was New Year's Day. The maid didn't come in. I had to clean up too. Pity, not much of a New Year in this house. Did you notice the bottle at all? Oh, I remember saying to Mrs. Brown that there wasn't much more than a tablespoon left in it. And perhaps she'd better order another bottle in case Mr. Brown was getting mad if he had none. Now, this is important, Mrs. Davis. Can you place anyone, anyone at all, in this kitchen between the time Mrs. Brown brought the bottle in here and the time Dr. Westcott took it away? No one but the Frenchman, sir. Mr. Gomesh. I seem to remember, sir. I wouldn't want to get him in no trouble unless he deserved it. But he did come in here and jabber at me. And then he used his little book. Little book? He's got a dictionary. Looks up the French and finds the English. Right comical he is sometimes. Oh, I see. Then he looked in his dictionary. And he said, bottle. He said something else. I didn't pay much attention. I just pointed at the kitchen drawer. Did he take the bottle out of the drawer? I wouldn't know, sir. For all I know, he just wanted to be sure it was in a safe place. I heard him open and close the drawer. That was all. Then he went out. Did he have a chance to put it back? 
Lots of chances. I was that busy running in and out. That's too bad. Oh, excellent team. The inspector was never a man to accept loose ends. He ran all his leads to earth. This is the approach which brought him finally to where Jules Gamache was staying. Do you accuse me, Inspector? Merely asking routine questions, Mr. Gamache. Did you have any reason to dislike or resent Mr. Brown? None. No, but of course not. Have you ever had any strychnine in your possession? No, but pourquoi? Why should I? I can't say, sir. I can only try to fill in the blank spaces. Someone, you see, gave Mr. Brown the opportunity to poison himself. That kind of gift is murder, Mr. Kamesh. <laughs> Naturellement. I'm afraid I must ask you to remain in England, sir, until the case is closed. But for me, this will be a pleasure. I assure you, Inspector, I wish to see vengeance on this murderer. I loved Mr. Brown almost as a brother. Once, a smooth, blank wall for Scotland Yard to face and search for some crack somewhere. The interest in the case emmered down. Nothing was happening. Then the newspapers picked up a lead, something so fantastic, the men assigned to watch the Binnacle Inn in its neighborhood hardly believed their own ears. It seems that Jules Gamache began to write letters. And to the police. There is one suspect who had not been questioned. A man long subject to Alfred Brown's whims and temper. The pot washer at the inn, known to me only as Georges. I point the finger of suspicion. Observe, gentlemen of Scotland Yard, the comings and goings of Monsieur Arthur Brookfield, solicitor to Madame Brown. This man is in and out of her residence at all hours. Certainly not all of this can be on business. Was jealousy entering the picture now? The letters aroused a good deal of attention once they leaked to the newspapers, as such things have a way of doing. Jules Gamache was quite pleased. When the reporters swarmed about him, the photographers took his picture. Many times, in many poses. This was fame at last an impoverished inventor living on his wits. Come in, sir. Are you asked to see me on the Brown case? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, my name is uh, Scott, sir. Uh, I'm the owner of a chemist shop in Woking. Not too far from the Binnacle Inn, is it? Uh, just far enough to miss some of the news, but uh, this morning I saw this newspaper. Ah, uh, yes, yes, our French friend... Do you know him? He was a customer of mine uh, there was a few weeks back, uh, just before Christmas. Go on, Mr. Scott. He asked for strychnine. Oh, what excuse did he give? Oh, uh, something about experiments in the wireless. He uh, kept consulting a small English-French dictionary to express himself. The wireless, yes, that's the new excuse. Although why they should think the wireless operations entail the use of poisons is beyond me. Did you sell him any? I did. I, I made him sign the poison book. The name he used was Hatch. Mr. Scott, do you think you can identify this man among a dozen others? Well, Mr. Scott? That's he, sir. The short fellow with the bright black eyes. Thank you, mister. Monsieur le chemist. Bonjour, c'est un plaisir. Uh, how you say, uh, one moment, please. Uh, oui, ici. It is a pleasure that we meet again. Jules Gamache, I have a warrant for your arrest on a charge of willful murder. I must warn you that anything you may say... Well, that's the story. And today, the dictionary which played its part in that story can be found in its place in the Black Museum. <laughs> Orson Welles will be back with you in just a moment. Truly a strange, impassioned little man, Jules Gamache. He's half crazy, half sane. You wonder about him. And you know, to add to the dilemma of his personality, is one last point. While Jules was awaiting execution, he wrote another letter to Inspector West, 
stating that shortly after the death of Al Brown, he, Jules, saw a woman. Whether the woman was the cook or his beloved Betty, he didn't know. Secrete something behind some loose bricks in the garden wall at the Binnacle Inn. Of course, the police investigated. They found two small jugs. One with crystalline strychnine in it, and the other with a solution of the same poison. Now, the question is, did Jules Gamache put those jugs there himself, or did one of the women? And if the latter, why did Gamache wait until just before his death to reveal this? Was it some odd form of gallantry? Well... I guess no one will ever know. And now until next time, till we meet in the same place and I tell you another story about the Black Museum, I remain as always obediently yours. This is WDCBFM Glen Ellen.